So uh, we are very happy and proud to present Sven Matti, uh, the father of the dragons from Game of Thrones. I have been waiting for this moment since you agreed on coming here <laughs> and I'm very happy to have you as, as our guest. Please welcome. Thank you. new season of Game of Thrones, um, where hopefully pretty soon the next or uh, second teaser will come out with uh, the first dragon shot. So they're grown a little bit. Um, we're doing ex events and, and automotive industry stuff and traditional commercials. But of course you're all here to see our work on Game of Thrones, so Let's skip this and, uh, or before we start our work, there's of course the shooting. And I've selected some images for you, uh, which gives you an impression of how that normally looks like. So you can see here, um, there's a lot of sets involved. And this is what I think makes Game of Thrones such a believable fantasy series. Uh, it's not shot producers and the director. Um, you have to know a director is on a TV series not that important because he's delivering the shots, he's doing the work with the actors. Um, so on Game of Thrones there were seven different directors for the episodes. So the EPs, the executive producers, uh, are the real heads behind everything, so they keep it together, they have a look for the style um, that it doesn't feel different from episode to episode. So this was one of the first concepts we got for the shadow creature. Um, should be some kind of human uh, with uh, smoke effects. Um, so that just gave us the first idea. Um, this is a concept, and it's quite, quite dark, hope you can see it, um, is based on the shot plate. So the concepts you've seen just before, we're just before the shooting, and this is a concept um, with the original plate. This is the second one, because there are not no simulations involved. 
and uh, it helps us just to talk with the client how fast and in which way the shadow creature should climb out of the mother. So the next version uh, was a little bit more rubbery. Um, and uh, then we had a version with more tentacle work, it's crawling out. So playing with this idea is uh, very helpful at the beginning before we go into the next step, which is the simulation. So um, simulations is something the computer can do for us uh, because it's not handmade. So we can set some um, values and let the computer do the work. And it's pretty much like in reality. So when you have the water tank I was just talking about, we just drop the ink in. We can do the same in the computer. It's not always successful, uh, especially when you do it quick. So this was a liquid ink test and it just didn't feel right. It's a little bit too jerky, in the motions, but um, maybe helpful later on. So we thought maybe we have to go a little bit more into a fluid simulation, having it a little bit more like water. And this is a test we did early on. So you can see behind all that the basic uh, animation of the creature crawling out. And uh, the good thing when you do computer simulation is um, you don't have to stick to the real world uh, situation. So what we did here, we just um, killed the gravity. So it's like water in a zero gravity space. So that's why it stays and behaves slightly different than real water. This is the second test because the creature should just form out of nothing in midair. And the same what we can do with water, we can do with smoke and gas. And what we did here is we took the animation, made it reverse, did the simulation, reversed it again. So the smoke looks like smoke, but not really like smoke, because it's just a very simple trick, uh, which is uh, done a lot in, uh, during all the times of visual effects when you just do something reverse. And all these developments uh, lead us to a lot of different layers. Um, so it's hard to see. So we have different kinds of simulations. Um, and from these different elements, we can pick the best parts and merge them together to the final shot. Here again, different water simulations or ink simulations. So when you just change some s small values, um, it can look totally different. So more water, more swirly, and then we might just use selections of these different elements. So in all this development in R&D and blocking leads to the production of the shot. So this is all work we can do slightly before we really have to deliver the shot because it takes some time. And um, we felt very much prepared. And this was our first version we sent to the client. A um, lot of black in front of black. Sorry for that. Um, so we thought, OK, we are pretty close, and maybe um, we're done with that shot, because he was so happy. But actually, uh, 78 versions later, <laughs> we're still working on that. Uh, but then he was really happy. So it's uh, a little bit hard to predict at the beginning uh, on which details he might like us to work on. So this is the final shot. Again, dark.
So dragon shots will be brighter. Dragon shots are always in bright sunlight. Uh, for all the ones who have seen the series, uh, you know that already. So it's lots of colors involved, and, and uh, Danny is always um, in the sun. Of course, Westeros um, is quite big, so we had to extend and produce a lots of environment shots. I made a little overview. Um, which kind of environments we had to do. Overall, uh, uh, 67 different ones um, in 305 shots. And you can see on the episodes, it's not always evenly distributed. So uh, especially in, in episode 9, we had a lot of environment work to do. So I uh, thought to explain a little bit the technique of how environments are created. Um, I selected two examples. First one is Pike. Um, creating castles or mountains um, is something done in the visual effects industry quite uh, a while. Um, so it's done with a matte painting. Matte painting is a word which comes from the old days uh, where really paintings have been created. There were paintings on glass, and this glass was put in front of the camera. Camera was just filming through. Um, and with this technique, you could just bring in areas um, normally you can't shoot. We do that pretty much the same. So starting again with the first concept from the client, uh, this is how they thought Pike should look like. We got a production painting as well, um, which also gives you a little bit more information about the mood. You will see that it changed completely, so it was originally meant to be much darker uh, and moody, and uh, it turned out that it will be shot in more sunny environment and uh, bright daylight. So this is how Pike looks like. Um, this is a painting, so we don't do that with building geometry. This is a uh, Photoshop rendering in 2D, which we then just merge with the background plate. You'll see that here. So this is the shot plate, and these are the layers which come on top. The 2D painting technique is possible because the camera is not doing much, so it's just a slight motion to the side. And because you can't see on the, on the side of the castle or behind, uh, painting is the quickest way and the best way to achieve that. For different angle, of course, you have to do another painting. So this is of the tech recce. Tech recce is when you do a location scouting. So this is not really a plate. And we just did a quick drawing as a concept. Um, this is how the matte painting looks like. So this is what the artist creates. And this is then again merged with the background plate, which looks in combination like this. And again, you can see it feels the camera is moving, but we're not really having a perspective change. Heron Hall is. Um, Another example where we did a slightly different approach. So, of course, starting again with a concept. It's a, a destroyed city with lots of runes. So this is another one. It's always great to have that because when you have an image to talk about, uh, you're nearly on the same page. And this is a perspective um, how the shot should look like in the end, pretty much. And this is how it was shot. So you can see there's a set. It's uh, quite big, but it's, of course, not enough to show uh, the destroyed city of Heron Hall. So first of all, we get rid of all the elements we don't need. And this is what is left over. And with the plate, we are going again into some kind of a quick concept face because when, when you get the, the production painting from the client, he's, it's quite there, but it's not, he's not always happy. So 
we just played again with lots of ideas, and I will just click through some versions we did. You can see it's very quick, it's just painted, playing with different objects, different positions of these towers and houses, till a point where we have an approved concept. So this is what the client liked and loved, and from that we took it to the next step. We built a very rough geometry in the computer, meaning it's like sculpting clay in the real world, and it looks like this. You can see it's not very detailed, but for the matte painting it will be enough, because we are projecting our image from Photoshop back onto that geometry. And then we can move the camera a little bit more, uh, which was the need of this shot. So when I just project it back from the same angle, it looks exactly the same like before. And then we can start to do the actual matte painting. So bringing in all the colors, all the details from photos we took from castles, which looks like this. And this is everything in motion. So the different layers again. We are putting in small people, soldiers, we shot in front of a green screen, flags, and because the camera is panning backwards, this projection technique was the best way to go. To go. So Heron Hall from another angle, you can see here, extension of the castle. We had no green screen here, and this was very tricky, uh, because having a white horse against a bright sky can have these edges in the motion blur. And this is always when you are on set with every project, you learn a little bit more and what you try to prevent the next time. So I have a little shot roundup of environments we did for the second season of Game of Thrones. So you have seen its environments means in can be very much. So it's not just bringing in castles or extending castles. It's like having uh, a big tent camp. Um, so on set, normally you have, if you're lucky, you have t 10 tents in the foreground, and the rest will be extended. Or uh, even it's just a cellar, um, which is very short during the shooting, which just get uh, extended into the background. So it's um, quite fun to do that, because it's just a variety of things to do. Dragons is now the main topic, and um, I think that's where we spend a lot of work into, because um, as we got involved in Game of Thrones, um, Digital creatures are not happening very often, so we were quite enthusiastic about it. Um, characters are normally just happening in feature films because it takes quite a while of time and money. 
So on a TV series, it's normally not possible to do that when you want to have a good result and a believable result. And um, like Game of Thrones, where everything feels very much believable, the dragons had to hold up. So again, you know that already, research is the way to start. And in our case, we had a dragon from the season one. Uh, another company did that, and it were, I think, around five shots at the end of the first season, which uh, showed them for the first time. And the supervisor of the, from the production side did uh, a little painting on top of that image, how he thought the dragons should look like in season two. So this was, again, a good start for us. A little bit darker, a little bit more aggressive. Not that cute, but because they were the same size nearly. Um, and what we did, we did a lot of research. So on the top left, uh, this was an image we uh, got from the client, which uh, was a representation of the surface, which should look be a little bit oily. That's why we have that oily surface on the top right. And um, this big dragon painting in the back. So I don't know if the dragons will really look like this when we are in season five or six. Uh, I'm pretty sure it will change because it changes slightly with every season. And what we had uh, on the bottom, you can see the so-called stuffies. These were little puppets they used on set for the actors and for us as a lighting reference. So it's always very helpful when you have something which is not there in reality um, to just put it into the frame, um, have the actress just doing the rehearsal with that puppet and then you just take it out and she has to talk or just to act with the invisible creature she has to imagine. Um, I was very lucky to find this alligator uh, I always thought they are more greenish, or, um, but they seem to be alligators, which nearly had our dragon appearance skin-wise. So this was quite a good reference for us. And uh, we thought of the dragons at a certain point, uh, a time should be able to fly. So when we are attacking a creature, we are starting from the inside out to make it believable. So we are looking for skeleton reference. Um, this is a bird. And uh, you can see that the breast is quite heavy, which is of course needed for the muscles to just move the wings. And this was not quite there in the design where the chest was quite small. Um, so we tried to change it slightly without losing the overall shape. Uh, this is burnt meat, because dragons, uh, you know that already, uh, don't like raw meat. It must be well burned. So how does burnt flesh look like? Barbecue party is always a good trick. And um, finding a life-size, uh, or not life-size, a, a life-like uh, animal um, to start the research, um, I was thinking, OK, how? can we or how can I find a, a, a dead bird? This was the easiest way um, to go to the supermarket and uh, finding a chicken. Chicken is a bird. Of course, we all know they are not uh, the biggest uh, uh, flyers, uh, but they have wings. So and even when they are a little bit smaller, the functionality is pretty much the same. So um, all the animators and character TDs, I'm explaining what they're doing. Um, character TDs are doing the uh, puppet rig, let's call it like this. So they are building the bones and the handles the animators can work with to make the puppet alive. And they all had to stand around the chicken and uh, I forced them to just move the wings to see what is possible for the wing itself, where are restrictions, how far the wings can move, the arms can move. And for example, uh, we seen that the neck is, is a little bit more in, in the back. So we tried to find the spots where we have to place our virtual 
skeletons uh, 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 joints to make it move like a real bird. After a while, they thought it's quite fun. At the beginning, no one wanted to touch it. <laughs> you can see here, it's, uh, even without touching it yourself, it uh, gives us an idea of the possibilities. Um, also, it was helpful for how is light going through skin uh, when we come to a later process of shading. And what we did, uh, it's sorry if there are vegetarians um, among us, it's a little bit disgusting, but uh, I thought it was helpful to just peel off the skin on one half to see how the muscles are underneath the skin working and how they are built, because then we can reproduce that in our virtual model as well. Um, there was a question if we are using a muscle system. Well, actually, a, uh, a finite element analysis model. Yeah, um, I, I'll explain it later. So we, we didn't use a muscle system here um, because it, uh, it's quite uh, heavy to compute with the skin sliding on top of it and how the muscles react. I know. Uh, we do that now on episode uh, on the season four. So, but here uh, we. Our main goal was to deliver, because not deliver is uh, the worst you can do. So um, we came up with another technique uh, I will show you in a second. Before we can do anything uh, muscle-wise or animation-wise, of course, we have to create the model first. This is uh, a so-called turntable. So we are not scanning an object. So in, in former times, you, uh, normally uh, the artist did a clay sculpture and this was scanned to the computer to have all the proportions. In the meanwhile, there are programs out there, it's called ZBrush, uh, where it really feels like sculpting with clay in the computer. So it's a very quick way of modeling. So you can scratch into it and just pull stuff out and push stuff in. And with that model, you can see here a little bit more details. All the scales have to be built because we were not quite sure how close we uh, will have to get to the dragon. Um, color is, of course, a second topic. So how should the dragons look like? Should they have patterns on it? Uh, so these were just rough 2D drawings again because before we go into the 3D process, we always start with the 2D work. So these were different variations for the green dragon. And um, the client, for example, uh, choose none of these. So he thought, oh, no, maybe spots or stripes. Uh, let's not do that for uh, season two, maybe later. So they should be very um, similar in the color. This is the first color test for the black dragon with the slight red on the, in it. And here you can see the model we started with. And remember the breast bone uh, on the real bird? It's totally different. So we couldn't change it a lot, but we made it slightly bigger at the end. Development also includes technical stuff again. So this is a test we did for the wings. So the skin between the wing fingers is simulated like with a cloth simulation. You normally do for t-shirts or trousers, but of course can be used here as well. So we can have the wind blowing into it and the cloth is reacting to the motion of the wings. To have the impression of muscles, we used a tension map. Um, this gives us the opportunity to bring in wrinkles and um, stretchiness or m muscle bulging. And what you can see on the top right is a color code which shows us where the skin gets compressed or stretched. So green is normal, red areas are squashed, and blue areas are stretched. And 
then we can say, OK, when we have a red area, bring in a different displacement map. It's quite technical, so I'll just uh, keep it like that. But uh, after the presentation, there is definitely time for uh, questions to go a little bit more into detail. Uh, I already uh, said that we weren't sure how close we'll get to the dragons, so we did a little test of uh, how we can make the scales go with the surface. Um, luckily, we hadn't to do this uh, on season two and three, but on season four, with the dragons being much, much bigger overall and much bigger in frame, um, we have to really pin small objects for the scales onto the surface, which is, again, quite heavily to compute. The dragons should be chained uh, uh, in episode 10. So we had to do a little chain rig. So what you can see here is a screen grab from the computer where the TDs are working. So the idea was that we wanted to have control over how the chains are placed in the shot to make it look nice. And afterwards, the simulation takes over and makes them fall down. And you can see here it's not, not real time, but you can just pull on that handle, and the chains are really following and without any kind of stretching. So this is something very helpful. And in former times, uh, the animator would have to have the chain animated by hand. So we can make the chain react on objects, uh, which was important because we have all three dragons on that podest um, reacting with each other. And of course, the wings with the cloth simulation are pushing the chain also. So it was uh, quite tricky. You have seen the model in gray. And this is how it looks with textures on top. Textures are like when you think of um, putting the paper on a wall. So we have the model and just uh, can wrap photos around, which are a combination of hand painted uh, um, images and photographs. And this together with um, the shading, which is basically um, a representation of how light reacts on a surface. So you have different materials like wood or metal or plastic, which looks different because some have highlights, some are very glossy or reflective. And this is all done in the shading department. So this is the green, which is the variation of the black. And this was the green one where we just had to change the colors. So with having the development in progress, uh, or, or let's say not, it's finished. It's, it's never quite finished, so that's why in progress. Uh, in animation, where the fun part starts, we always come to a point where we, where we know, oh, OK, we have to change something in the skeleton. So it's n nearly finished when we uh, have the animation done. Um, and to see how the model reacts, we did a little animation test right at the beginning before we got a plate. So we knew that in the first shot, the dragon should ride on the shoulder. So that's why this gray object is just moving up and down. And we did that just to show the client the dragon for the first time in motion to get an idea uh, of he wants the dragon to be very calm or very jerky or, but it uh, felt quite good for him. So that was a good start for us as well. The animation looks normally like this. So this is how the client also sees the animation. So before we go into rendering, which is making it uh, colored and ready for compositing, where we combine it with the background plate, um, this has to be approved. And this is great because this is just a quick play blast, we call it, so which doesn't have to compute along. This was quite a very, very heavy shot to do for the animator. Normally, you have 
maybe four seconds of animation to do, and this was uh, quite long. So you have to think of what the dragon can do. Uh, so you have to think a little bit like a director, because the original uh, idea or is, or the information you get is dragon riding on shoulder. But what should he do? So is he blinking? Is he roaring? Is he looking at Danny? Or is he just playing with the wings? So you have to come up with ideas, which is always the first round. <laughs> Another shot here where you can see the animation is when he's trying to just grill the meat. And of again, before we can go into simulating fire, the red cone is just a representation for us and for the client when the fire breathing will be happening. So, and this is how the shot builds up. So, first of all, we do a match move. A match move is a 3D tracking, uh, in this case, of the shoulder armor. Because when we know where that shoulder is in our virtual 3D space, then we have the possibility to just place the dragon onto the shoulder. You can see these red dots. These dots help us to do the tracking, and they have to get painted out later by hand. And here in the gray representation, you can see the dragon uh, with the animation and the simulation so that the gloss is reacting. And in compositing, um, the colored rendering will be adjusted that the colors match perfectly with the background plate. So this is another example. This is um, how the rig looks like here at the first part. So here, these are all these handles the animator can just pull and push and set keyframes. And um, this yeah, is basically the puppet control. So you're not really adjusting the skeleton itself or pushing the skin into a new shape. Uh, you have these control objects. And from this, we always have to check, or we do a check with the skeleton inside. Uh, it's important because when you go into animation, sometimes um, you do stuff with the arms or with the legs, which would maybe break the bones. Uh, this is a technique you normally do when you have a 2D animation, like on the Disney cartoons. You, you stretch the arms more than they would uh, or could do physically. Um, but we wanted to keep the animals in a real life environment, and that's meant for us not to do stuff like this. And this is always just helpful checking with the bones. FX means for us all stuff like rain, explosions, and fire. And when we have dragons, we have, of course, fire as well. So the client asked us not to go for a realistic fire, at least in season two. It changed a little bit on the third season. Um, so it should be some kind of a dragon fire, which is starts maybe with a normal, like a normal fire, but then has some kind of a um, mystical addition to that. So we implemented tiny little explosions. And these are different parts of the simulation. So we're starting with particles emitting fluid into the air. And then we have little um, elements which ignites that fuel, and it starts to burn. So simulations again, try to mimic what's happening in the real world, and then you can go ahead from this and change it slightly. So um, now you've seen environments, you have seen the shadow creature, you have seen um, a first approach on the dragons, and uh, I just did a little cut together of the shots of uh, the episodes 1 to 10 from season 2 before we go into season 3 to see what happened to the dragons in the third season. So this is a recap and maybe you can just pull down the lights again.
So, um, season two was a great success uh, for HBO. Uh, so, immediately, I think it was maybe even after the first two episodes were aired, they decided to green light the next season, uh, which brought us again into the game. Um, having the dragons, or so much love by the audience, um, the dragons were one of the key um, advertisement elements for the upcoming season. So I don't know if it was here in Sweden, I think it was mostly in America. They had these shadow dragons uh, on newspaper ads, so just both two pages. We're just a fake page with a dragon uh, shadow on top of it. Um, they had it on, uh, I, I don't know if it's, it might be the HBO headquarters itself, and uh, in New York as well on buses, so it was a huge campaign. And uh, this campaign started before we even knew how the new dragon should look like. So that's why the shadow silhouette is um, quite standard, so you can see everything uh, in the shadow, whatever you like to. Of course, basically, it's a little bit based on what we did on season two. And um, the difficult thing with having a lot of fans on a, a show, they are, of course, keen on look, uh, seeing uh, stuff from the new season, which leads to early trailers or teasers. And um, this is always tricky because when you have to deliver a trailer shot, this happens normally when you're just starting your work. So um, on the season three, they decided to have the trailer shot very early. I think it was in January. It should be finished. And we started our work in late October, maybe. And normally, we, we are finishing. Um, of course, first it's aired in, in end of April. So um, this trailer should, should include a dragon as well. So, and while we were building the dragon, we had to deliver and to show first images. So these were the first images released uh, on the trailer shot. So um, lucky for us was that we see the dragon just from behind, because we had no idea how the dragon should look like from the face. Um, it's just a slight hint of the dragon's uh, head visible. And while we're working on that, um, we had to do two ads for an uh, American TV magazine, which uh, show the dragons uh, within the new size and with new build features. So this was running while we're working on the shots itself. So this is the second one. And um, of course, you know nearly all experts how uh, digital dragons have to be created. So uh, I have for you now the making of of the season three. Um, we used nearly the same techniques because the dragons um, are a little bit bigger, so the new size is a little bit like a small uh, goose or a small um, dog. So we could use the same techniques, which was very helpful for us, because we could just build on the experience uh, we had for season two. So let's see how the dragons are looking like in season three.
And this was season three. And thank you very much. I hope uh, it was not uh, too much information. Uh, I know it's uh, always quite tricky uh, because it's a lot of sp special words used, uh, which we uh, use on our daily basis and uh, very complicated to understand. And um, because of this, if you have questions, uh, I would be happy to answer if I can. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent work, by the way. But you're